Laverne and Shirley won't be seen tonight, so we can bring you a very special episode of The Gen X Files. Welcome to The Gen X Files. I'm Jim. I'm Adam. And today's show is all about The, the Price, Price is Right. right. Jim Esham, come on down. I will say, being at a taping of The Price is Right was one of my favorite memories in L.A. Oh, it's fun. Yeah. So much fun. I've been to a cup. A couple of them. I've only been to one, I, but it was so much fun. We also had a very large group, so it was very fun. I also had a friend who was on, and he he's a very interesting – he's a friend of Lucas's, so this will tell you. <laughs> uh, but he was on, and he told yeah, – I think he was dressed as a chimney sweep. And he told the host, he's like, oh, no, I'm a chimney sweep. And then he starts talking about – I mean, he was, like, <laughs> making up this whole persona and everything. Nice. It's hilarious. It's it very funny. Awesome. Well, take yourself back to 1972. Ooh. January 4th, the first scientific handheld calculator, the HP 35, made by Hewlett Packard, is introduced with a retail price of $395. Equivalent to just over $2,600 today. That's crazy to think that we didn't have cal- – we were using abacuses or yeah. abacai. <laughs> yeah. Well, also the fact that, that it's a calculator and it was like three grand. Remember when everybody was carrying around their handheld abacus? Yeah, yeah. The pocket abacuses. Like, shoop, shoop, putting yeah. their little beads to the ding, side. Ding, ding. Okay, well, that's 32%. I can now do trigonometry. I don't even know if kids have ab- abacuses anymore. Abacuses? <laughs> I don't I, – probably not. Let us know, people. <laughs> How many abacuses is in your house? Has, yeah. February 17th. I just want to say that's a lot of money for a calculator. Yeah, I said that. <laughs> I think we all have them on our phones now. Yeah, it's weird to think that at one point a calculator was costing that much. Now, granted, it's a scientific handheld calculator. I'm sure they probably had them. Yeah, it had like the square root buttons and stuff. Big (laughs) whoopity-doo. That's worth an extra $2,500. The old man had one of those. I don't know if he had one of the $2,000 ones, but he had to do a lot of conversions. I eventually had the Texas Instruments one that was the big, the TI-83 or whatever, TI-85. Yeah. Yeah. And then the... The ones with the printers? Like the accountants <laughs> use? Yeah, so they keep track. I love that sound. They don't use those anymore. No, but I, that's, I love those movies. Okay. That's 45. Yeah, no, yeah the ticket and the ticket Reels and reels. The sound of those yeah. clackety, clickety, clackety keys, man. It's very, it's very tactile. Oh, yeah. That'd be a good ASMR. Oh, yeah. There you go. Mm. Clickety clack. I'm going to start a show. Clickety mm. clack. With Jimbo. <laughs> February 17th. The Volkswagen Beetle sales exceed those of the Ford Model T when the 15,007,034th Beetle is produced. Good Lord. There's a lot of Beetles. Yep. Uh, original MSRP of $1,999, uh, equivalent to just over $13,500 today. Man, this is, inflation's huge. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Beatles, the German revenge. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, May 24th, the Magnavox Odyssey video game system is first demoed, making the dawn of marking the dawn of the video game age. It goes on sale to the public in August with an in- introductory price of ninety nine ninety five, equivalent to about six hundred and seventy nine dollars. Six hundred seventy nine dollars to D forty one cents. Uh, Which the funny thing is that it's about right yeah. <laughs> for, for game units now. I uh, I had a Mag- I didn't have like one of the nineteen seventy two. Yeah, yeah. I think I had like the Odyssey two. I think that's my been what it was. But it was Probably, the Magnavox yeah. Odyssey. Yeah. It was so cool, like presentation wise. Like the games were beautifully packaged. Oh yeah, with yeah. cloth maps and wow, and all sorts of like highly detailed lore. Books yeah, for these yeah. dungeon crawlers. Right, right. It's just a box and a ball and yeah. with a sword, you know, going <laughs> right, through right. killing quotey spiders. But they also had like this keyboard that every game came with an overlay. Oh, and supposedly yeah. Supposedly had all yeah. these special, you know, it was basically yeah. what RPGs are today. J- yeah. But, you know, all of the presentation, all of the flash, and all of the pageantry <laughs> with a, 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 right. a basically an Atari. Yeah, uh, with a. A two-bit, essentially, yeah. man, man, yeah. quote-unquote man. It's still really fun, though. I liked it. Oh, yeah, yeah, sure, sure. We got that. You know why we got it? 
Why did you get that? Because uh, my mom worked for Coldwell Banker as a real estate broker, oh, yeah. and they were owned by Sears at the time. And uh, every year, Sears would have a very special, very secret, very super night sale for oh, only the employees. Yeah. And it was super duper. Nice. And I remember every year I'd get to go, and I would get one thing, and but not – like a video game or anything. It was usually like a toy or something. But this year, it was like super cheap, and they got it for me, and nice. I was just, oh, man, I was bouncing off the walls on the way home. Oh, it was yeah. so exciting. Yeah. So exciting. I, I will never forget the day I got my first nice. unit. <laughs> it was exciting. September 4th, The Price is Right, hosted by Bob Barker, premieres on CBS at 10.30 a.m. Yeah, it actually started as a half-hour show. Super weird. Well, uh, I mean, yeah, they all were pretty much half-hour shows, yeah, weren't yeah, they, yeah. back then? Uh, yeah, yeah. That was usually, they, they, they broke up the chunks of the day into half-hour, uh, for the most part. Since 1972, The Price is Right has aired over 9,000 episodes and has given away more than $300 million in cash and prizes. Wow. It is one of the longest-running network shows in history and the longest-running game show. Man. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, The Price is Right was originally created in 1956 and produced by Bob Stewart for Mark Goodson, Bill Todman Productions. Oh, yeah. Mark, this is a Mark Goodson, Bill Todman production. (laughs) Well, yeah. Suits by Bonnie 5000. I was more in with the Mark, just the Mark Goodson, because Bill Todman unfortunately died in the late 70s, and Mm -hmm. apparently Mark, Mark Goodson said, well... My company now, wow, and took his took name the off of it. Off. But yeah, always at the end. This is a Mark Goodson production. Yeah. Uh, so Bob Stewart had already created one hit series for Goodson, Goodson Todman to tell the truth, and he later created the enormously successful Password. Uh, created a lot of game shows. Later, he would create s- shows like Jackpot and the Ten Thousand Dollar Pyramid. Great shows. Very great shows. Yeah. To tell the truth was awesome. My favorite part was at the end when they would be like, because you know what to tell the truth was. Yeah, like. yeah. You'd have three people yeah. who would pretend to be one person. Right. And you'd have three celebrity panel judges trying to figure out who was who, who was the real dude. Right. Who was. And then at the yeah. end, they'd be like, will the real Jonathan Franks please stand up? And then they'd all do the, the fake pump, the fake, fake pump, the fake, fake pump, <laughs> fake pump. Yeah. For about five minutes, fake pump, fake pump. Yeah. And then finally, the old guy would stand up and be like, I'm, I'm Jonathan Franks. Right, right. And then nobody would have picked him because he was the most boring person on the panel. But he ended up being, you know, the bank robber or whatever it was. You can catch uh, reruns of To Tell the Truth on uh, Buzzer, which is, <laughs> is on some – we randomly were watching it a couple weeks ago, and <laughs> To Tell the Truth is on. And it was uh, three Asian guys, and it got really weird, so I stopped watching it. Okay. Yeah. All right. <laughs> but yes. But yes, it was a great show. It's a really fun show. Goodson Todman Productions produced an insane amount of game shows. Family Feud, Classic Concentration, Match Game, Password, Beat the Clock. To tell the truth, Goodson's personal favorite show, I've got a secret! That's my line, Card Sharks and Tattletales. Yeah, and there was a ton of others after uh, Toddman died. I, Goodson produced a bunch in the late 80s. He, the, the, all the ones he was sitting on, because Toddman was like, those are too lowbrow. <laughs> I don't want my name on them. And he's like, well, guess what, dead guy? Your name's not on them. <laughs> they did also produce uh, TV shows, like dramatic TV shows and, and a couple movies, but uh, never really caught on like their game shows did. Oh, yeah. 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 Uh, Bob Stewart attributes the creation of The Price is Right to watching an auctioneer from his office window in New York City auctioning off various merchandise items, which apparently was just Weird. a thing that happened in New York City. <laughs> so it was a street auctioneer? Uh, apparently. Sold for $75. My used gum. <laughs> oh, gross. The series. I got through college, baby. Auctioning yeah. off my used gum oh. on the corner of Boylston and Boylston. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the series, hosted by Bill Cullen, premiered on NBC's daytime schedule on November 26th, 1956, and quickly spawned a primetime series that aired once a week. Mm. On the original version of The Price is Right, four contestants won a returning champion. The other three chosen from the studio audience bid on items or ensembles of items in an auction-style format, uh, which is, is what we talked about last week with Jeopardy. Always bring the champion back. Yeah. Play until you lose. Yeah. I, I, hey, man, I'm 100% for that. <laughs> the Price is Right fr- frequently featured a home viewer showcase, a multi-price package for which home viewers were invited to submit their bids via postcard. <laughs> That's crazy. Yeah, it's weird. This was a big part of the show. A, a lot huge of part of the show, but a lot of that time, like I remember, a lot of my youth was like filling out crap from yeah. the back of yeah. 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 comic books and yeah. sending them in, and Magazines you know, eight and, years later, yeah. getting a box of tiny little army men that 
did not live up to the hype. But or X-ray specs that didn't really X-ray when you spec them. <laughs> but uh, you know, yeah, it was a lot of filling out things or like contests yeah. or sweepstakes or you yeah, know. sweet lot of sweepstakes. The, the irony is that eventually they changed the showcase term to sweepstakes, uh, and I I'm assuming it was a big thing back in the day. Sweepstakes in general. Uh, it's a way to get people involved. Yeah. Um, the viewer who was closest to the actual retail price without going over won everything in the showcase, but one item was sometimes handmade, so the viewer could not check the price of all the items. Sneaky. It'd be really easy to send in and and essentially cheat. In fact, well, I'm sorry, but this uh, this oven mitt is worth seventeen thousand dollars. <laughs> There's a diamond in it hidden that you can't see. <laughs> Uh, very often, home viewers were stunningly accurate with their bids, including several viewers who guessed the price correctly down to the penny. Well, sure. I mean, they probably went down to their local store or yeah, whatever. And re- I mean, you couldn't – look, this was work. Yeah, yeah. You couldn't just yeah. Google shit back then. No. You had to no. actually go either to the library to do research. Yeah. Get out your 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 microfiche. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And your, your your Dewey Decimal System and your, and your cards, your – the cards, cards. What is it? What was the card thing <laughs> where you pick the cards? Oh, Dewey Decimal. It was a, the card. It was a um... yeah. Let's talk about million year old yeah, libraries. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean that was the thing. You had to actually go out and research things by going to places. You, you do, had to yeah, you fill things research. out by hand with a pen or pencil, and you had to walk I mean, down is... to the mailbox. You had to stamp it. You know, you had to do stuff. This is it's this what we've seen the last two episodes is that you do your research, you win. Like that's that's how it goes. Well, you know, I know we're going to get to this in the stepdad show, yeah. but when when we did the celebrity name game, mm-hmm. we worked our butts. I mean, we oh, I know, I remember totally trained for that, yeah, because we wanted to win. I mean, yeah, if you 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 can't just go in and be like, well, Ooh, whatever yes. happens, happens, yeah. you know, yeah. then you're going to yeah. lose. But if you bust your butt, you have a chance, baby. True. Uh, so in such a case of people getting things stunningly accurate, the Tide contestants originally were informed via telegram and asked to give the price of a specific item and continuing, continuing until one broke the tie. Telegram from Mrs. Johnson. <laughs> it's you won the sweep stake. Stop. It's like, sweep stake's coming in three days. Stop. You are, you are still tying. Reply, stop, stop. <laughs> send new. Th- it's like, just, it's, oh, it's so Please weird. Please send your bid by telegram. Yeah. What? How much do you think three packets of... Dawn Super. Yeah, there you go. Send your bid. Yeah. Via telegram. Stop. Uh, they later changed the tiebreaker so the person who was first to send in the correct bid won the prize. Yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> Save a lot of time and Yeah, effort. yeah. But I mean, look, this is this before or after the big game before. show? Before, okay. Yeah. In 1959, shortly after the quiz show scandal broke, most game and quiz shows lost their popularity rapidly and were canceled. Oh, my God. You don't understand how upset America was oh, at that yeah. quiz show scandal. I mean, there's that great movie yeah. which, called Quiz Show, quiz show. strangely enough, <laughs> uh, directed by Robert Redford. But the fallout from that, oh yeah, you know, because people weren't skeptical conspiracy theorists. You know, people no. trusted back not, then. Yes, not at They this trusted time, their yeah. government. Yeah. They trusted the news. They trusted the TV. They trust. you know, every, it was all about being trustworthy. You know, yeah, we want to keep you, integrity. If, it, you, it was a, if you didn't, you were very much the outlier. Yes. And you were shunned by yes. society. It was crazy time. Yeah. Crazy time where actually people, <laughs> they were held accountable. It's weird to think that that's how it was. <laughs> held accountable for their actions. Oof. But, yeah. Uh, but yeah, I mean, this, the fact that it destroyed an industry. It did, for the most part. For, I mean, almost all. There's yeah. only one left. Yeah, one little soldier I mean, standing on the field, and it did, and it affected everything. Yeah. I mean, if you ever are on a a taping of a game show, oh my god, the standards and practices lady it just hovers and waits and waits, and they will stop whatever they need to mm. to make sure everything's fair and, and accurate. Yeah, no, it's it. Yeah, they they're it's very above board now. It has yeah. to well, be. it has to be. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it, I mean. There's yeah well we'll talk about it yeah the Price is Right was the exception uh, Goodson and Goodson and Tobman had built a squeaky clean reputation upon relatively low stakes games we're good guys yeah <laughs> so uh, thusly as the more popular competition was eliminated the Price is Right became the most watched game show in the country and remained so for the next two years oh yeah because it was like the only game in town yeah you yeah. know I mean maybe well, they was, had like to tell I mean, the truth or something I mean things yeah, that didn't have not, any sort right. of that you couldn't really cheat at. Right. Yeah. Like Celebrity more, panel shows more, more than game shows. Yeah, all, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's true. That's true. 
Uh, the show was sponsored primarily throughout its run by Unilever, thus uh, then known as Lever Brothers Corporation. Lever Brothers. Yeah. Sponsored by Lever Brothers Corporation, the maker of Dove Soaps, Dove Beauty Bars, Imperial Margarine, Whisk Laundry Detergent, Handy Andy Liquid Cleaner. It was all stuff, you know. Handy Andy Liquid Cleaner. When you need to clean, ask Andy. He's handy. There you go. That was good. <laughs> I used to do radio ads in the 50s and 60s. <laughs> So the four contestants of the week would usually receive a complimentary supply of Dove Beauty Bars. Uh, an alternate sponsor was Spiedel Watch Band. Spiedel. No, notably, uh, most notably for their then new Twisto Flex Band. Holy moly, man. That you changed. The, oh. the Twisto Flex? Well, yes, because it changed watch bands forever. Because it, you could it, just it, slip it. your old watchy poo on and then it had like a little... Yeah. Little chunk, but you could just pull it off because it has the expando bando. I remember being young and playing with my dad's Twisto Flex band watch all the time. Sure, it was and then fascinated getting, me. getting his hair caught in, and he's like, "God damn it! Why do you <laughs> get, get your hands off my watch? What are you, a little weirdo?" <laughs> get my own skin caught in it and be like, "What Lord. am I doing?" Yeah, you know what? It's time for you to get the hell away from me. Go play with your Legos. In 1963, the Price is Right switched networks, and both the daytime and primetime series moved to ABC. Uh, three studio contestants, including the returning champion, played. The fourth chair was filled by a celebrity. Hold on, hold on. So the champion, did he go from, did he bounce networks too? So did it? They did. He actually, started. Yeah. So the is he like show. one of the only contestants that spanned two networks? Like he, he I, yeah, I must have been. It's pretty cool. I mean, he's and he's got it, some well, wagons. To that effect, The Price is Right is the only game show to have been appeared on all three networks because eventually in 72 it got premiered on cbs sure. so it just ran through all the big three yeah but yeah I'm, I'm positive that that one champion literally switched networks uh with the show pretty cool uh so the fourth chair was usually filled by a celebrity who played for either a studio audience member or home viewer if the celebrity was the big winner of the show the civilian contestant who had the most winnings was considered the champion uh it's unknown what would have happened in the event of a shutout with a celebrity winning i don't think it ever happened so celebrities are pretty dumb <clears throat> yeah and I think they and would probably I, throw stuff if need be. I don't know if they really are aware of the yeah. price of milk or How much is a cheese. Dove Beauty Bar? I don't know, $1,000. What do you <laughs> want? Marjorie! Marjorie! Marjorie's my assistant. Marjorie! How much is Dove? Soap! No, not Doves. <laughs> I don't want Doves. Actually, fact. Actually, yes. Give, give me 60. Some. Give me 60 live Doves. <laughs> don't ask me why. Anyway, what was the question? When the show moved to ABC, several CBS affiliates took up ABC secondary affiliation to show the prices right, uh, especially if its market lacked full ABC affiliation. Well, yeah, I and, mean, just to explain, some yeah. markets, some areas didn't have all three network affiliates. Yes. They only had maybe one or two stations in the area. Yeah, so, it's just that they just have – nobody had set up the that, that TV station. Right, which is so weird that you could, you know, kind of – absorb other shows onto your network I, affiliate kind of thing. I mean, everybody contracts, wanted to make money, yeah, but it yeah. was just kind of, it was more slippery back then. Yeah, yeah. Goodson, Goodson Todman wanted The Price is Right to be ABC's first non-cartoon color show, but the network could not afford to convert to color. Uh, ABC was not, did not have as much money. In fact, in my market growing up, the ABC affiliate was the by far the newest and the cheapest like their newscast was so sad really it was it was just so i don't know why i but it was always way dead last and it was just like they would get the worst uh people to come in and work on that show work on the the news it was just it was weird hmm. yeah I, I don't know if something going on at abc i don't know well i could also you know it's a independently owned station D true and true. True. you know i mean it could be just a very cheap as a owner. son of somebody who owned radio stations broadcasting and was in broadcasting of course I absorbed all of that knowledge <laughs> through DNA. Uh, no, but it's like, you know, a bad boss runs a bad station. Uh, regardless. Yeah, yeah. The interesting thing is that while it was on uh, the original NBC when it, before it moved to ABC, it was actually in color. But because ABC couldn't afford to do it in color, it actually reverted back to black and white. When it <laughs> what a bummer. Over. Yeah, it's kind of weird. I just, it's a very uh, colorful show, too, at least in the, you know. 
Yeah, I mean, I mean, starting with the seventy two series, I'm assuming back then it probably was too. I mean, yeah, I, all those know, crazy wind. big, you know, flower power flowers yeah, and crap, oh, yeah, all that seventies yeah. goomba. <laughs> uh, while many of the prices on the original Prices Right were normal, standard game show fare such as furniture, appliances, home electronics, first trips, cars, there were many instances of outlandish prices being offered. It was particularly true of the nighttime version, which had a larger prize budget. Prizes such as... A 1926 Rolls Royce with chauffeur. A Ferris wheel. Shares of corporate stock. An island in the St. Lawrence Seaway. A Piper Caribbean airplane. A submarine. (laughs) Ooh, submarine, man. I'm watching that documentary on uh, HBO about the the journalist that went on the submarine with the billionaire and he murdered her and chopped her. Oh, really? So oh, okay. Cool. Wow. I didn't, hey, I, I was like, I had I no you, idea what you're talking about. I know you hated you that did. vegan documentary, but oh, this one's God. good. You'll enjoy it. Okay. This okay. I'll it's very, check that one out. it's Norway. It's very Norse. Oh, okay. Interesting. Interesting. I think it's Norway. Anyway, it's one of those Swedes. Scandinavian. States, yes. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Swede states. <laughs> They're not all Sweden. Jim. Yeah, they are to me. <laughs> all, them, all them whites look alike. Sometimes uh, large amounts of food, such as a mile of hot dogs, along with buns and enough condiments, would complement something like a barbecue pit uh, and being offered as a bonus. Uh, More outlandish or exceptionally unique bonus prizes included something like accompanying a color TV. A live peacock! uh, Which is a play on the NBC logo to serve as a quote-unquote color guide. Accompanying a barbecue pit and the usual accessories. A live Angus steer! Accompanying a prize package of items needed to throw a backyard party. Big band legend Woody Herman and his orchestra. Accompanying a raccoon coat worth twenty nine ninety five. A sable coat valued at $23,000. Or a bonus prize of a 16 by 32 in ground swimming pool installed in the winner's backyard in a day's time. And a bonus prize of a trip to Israel to appear as an extra in the 1960 film Exodus. So just weird. Who, first of all, where the hell are you going to put a mile of hot dogs and buns? They're all going to just rot. It doesn't matter. And yeah. most uh, places, you know, they're not zoned to have Angus steers. Yeah, yeah. I, are you I, supposed to butcher it for your barbecue? I'm going to I'm gonna say that most people probably just took the cash. <laughs> yeah, and, and a lot of these were just oh, goofs. They were just, yeah, you know, yeah. They didn't really give them It was away. just to get people to watch. Yeah. They were gimmicks. It was just always funny when somebody would get something and then it would be like, you're going to get a new ride. And it's like a Shetland pony. Price is Right would do a lot of that like, here's your first ride. And it'd be like somebody on a trike. And then right. and then it'd be like a brand new motorcycle. Yeah, you know, and it's yeah. like, okay, you get the trike and the motorcycle. All right. Yeah. It's like, it's yeah. a wheelbarrow, yeah. you know, or somebody. And, or, they got, and, yeah. They gave away a lot of burrows. Yeah. A lot of donkeys were given yeah. away at that time. There was a donkey. There was a, let's make a deal did a lot of that. Well, there was a, a a surplus of donkeys in the seventies. There was that very famous was that donkey huge surplus, donkey outbreak, and, and well, they all they all exploded in population. Well, they had they had cut down the amount of donkeys you could hunt, mm-hmm. and so then they they got they yeah. just overgrew. And I think they they just kind of piled out of the Grand Canyon, just kind of like like <laughs> just World War Z. They just on kinda, top of each yeah, other, <laughs> kind of plopped they just out kept of there, birthing each other, and kept until going they until they made it to the Price is Right. <laughs> In the early 1960s, the dynamic of the national economy was such that the nighttime show could offer homes in new subdivisions, sometimes fully furnished as prizes, often with suspenseful bidding among the contestants. That's life-changing, man. That's crazy. I just love that it's due to the dynamic of the national economy. That's how good the economy was in the early 60s. Yes, because people, everybody could buy a home back then. Yeah, Yeah, you didn't. You know? (laughs) You could not afford your two-bedroom apartment. Your home costs like $300. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's you know? true. Uh, but can you put a down payment of 16 cents? Uh, <laughs> I have 18 cents. Uh, it doesn't leave me with two cents. Uh, I can only eat for two weeks on that. Mm. <laughs> All right, I'll put it down. Uh, not to be outdone, in the last two seasons of the nighttime run, the series actually gave away small business franchises. <laughs> Good Lord. <laughs> In some events, the outlandish prices were merely for show. For instance, in one episode, contestants bid on an original retail price for a 1920s car, but instead a one a more contemporary model. Well, sure. Yeah. On September 3rd, 1965, the show aired its final episode after nearly nine years on the air. What kind of submarine? Um... I'm assuming it was probably just like a personal submarine. I don't know. I'm really. Uh, I, I mean, I can't. It's not like a nuclear driven 40 you know, man submarine. It's like a decommissioned. 
World War II <laughs> was this, U-boat. They, they bought it from the Soviet Union yeah, in 1959. Yeah, and they're like, man, we don't need this. Stuff, yeah. uh, so <clears throat> the show was off the air for seven years. Uh, Good, Goodson and Todman tried to get it back on the air for quite a while until finally in 1972, it premiered on September 4th at 10.30 a.m. on CBS, one of three game shows to debut that day. Wow, it's a 10.30 a.m. baby a lot yeah. of times. Uh, the other two being The Joker's Wild, which was a quiz show based around getting questions from a slot machine. Joker's Wild. Which premiered at 10 a.m. It led into the show. And Gambit, based on the card game Blackjack. I don't remember Gambit, but I definitely remember Joker's Wild. I remember Joker's Wild. They brought that back a couple times uh, in, into the... Well, no, I guess it was the 70s. Yeah, no, I remember that. I remember seeing... I watch a lot of old game shows. <laughs> so I remember seeing all this crazy yeah, stuff. Yeah, well, I, I watched them when I was homesick. The show was first billed as the new Price is Right to distinguish itself from the earlier original version, but it proved so popular that in June 1973, Goodson and Todman decided to drop the word new from its title. Wasn't new anymore. Nope. During the week of September 8th to the 12th in 1975, the Price is Right experimented with a 60-minute episode format during what it called Anniversary Week. The you mean like the show 60 Minutes, where they just yeah, interviewed they, people in a, in yeah, a very it was contentious mostly just, manner? Yes. And it was it – was, well – it alternated between that and Barbara Walters just trying to spin the wheel as much as she could. She could never get it to move. Well, she couldn't yeah. reach it. She's a yeah. little lady. She's a tiny little. One. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the shows. This these shows. This is a week of shows actually introduced the showcase showdown spinning wheels. The first time they used it. Oh, was during this. Yeah. exciting. Yeah, because the sixty minutes uh, version they could they could break it up and do the the two showcases. Mm-hmm. The anniversary week experiment was a rating success and quickly led to the announcement of the permanent expansion of the prices right to sixty minutes. The format of the show has since remained virtually unchanged. Uh, new pricing games are generally added each year, while others are retired. Prizes in pricing games have kept pace with inflation, with games originally designed for four-digit prices of prizes, most often cars, adjusted to allow for five-digit prices. Hey. <clears throat> yeah. So that you mean like... If it was like a $7,000 car and it was yet, I guess, four digits, then it, they just made it five. Okay. Yeah, that's Okay, all. that makes sense. <clears throat> While the set has seen numerous de- redesigns and upgrades over the years, the show has maintained the similar aesthetic element from its premiere in 1972. All the big old weird hippie flowers and oh, yeah, psychedelics and stuff. The show has been taped on Stage 33 since the show's inception in 1972 at CBS Television City. Other shows taped on Stage 33 include... The Carol Burnett Show, Mama's Family, Hollywood Squares, Match Game PM, The $10,000 Pyramid, The $25,000 Pyramid, and Gilligan's Island. And, more recently, uh, Real Time with Bill Maher. Uh, oh, they nice. do it live on that same stage. Yeah, that's. I've, it's funny because I've only been to two live tapings of shows, and both of them were in the exact same stage. That's hilarious. <laughs> I yeah. saw him when he did his uh, politically incorrect show. He's tiny. Oh it, yeah, yeah. He's not big. He's, he's not a bobblehead. He has yeah. a big head yeah. and a tiny little body. Very large. But a very funny man. Yeah, he's but very a he's fine. odd little duck. <laughs> Uh, when Goodson Todman, Todman began shopping around the new version of The Price is Right, they originally wanted Dennis James to host the show. Well, of course they did. Yeah, I, I, I had no idea who Dennis James was. <laughs> <Why>? <laughs> Until 1976, Dennis James had appeared on TV more times and for a longer period than any other television star. That sucks. It's not even 50 years, maybe 40-something years. Yeah. And this guy is completely forgotten. Yeah. Except for probably super diehard game show nerds. I, but you're a die hard I'm a game super show die hard nerd. Game you should know this guy. No idea who this guy was. You should do a biopic on him. He was. I'll, like, I'll, I'll play him. No, there you go. That's I don't even know what he looks like. Alternately referred to as the dean of game show hosts and the godfather of game shows, he was the host of television's first network game show, uh, the Dumont Network's Cash and Carry in 1946. The Dumont Network presents Cash and Carry with your host. With your host. Dennis James! Yeah. yeah. I, don't, I don't think he sounded like that. <laughs> we go play the if he sounded like that games. and managed to have a long career, more power he to did. it. It was so weird. <laughs> I think people just were comforted at the fact that he had... James uh, James was fascinating. He had a lot of firsts, and this is a total aside, but like I just was amazed by the fact I'd never heard of this guy. He was the first person to host a telethon. Raising, oh, wow. raising more than seven hundred and fifty million dollars for United Cerebral Palsy over five decades is the the run of its host. Mm, so Jerry Lewis was just I, copying old Dennis James, you hack. He was in your in your yeah, oh, wow. yeah. in your most multiple dist. Oh, good lord, muscular dystrophy. muscular dystrophy. <laughs> I think I have multiple mus- dystrophy. Maybe I have muscular dystrophy in your stupid muscular dystrophy telethon. Wow. 
Yeah. Big headed uh, jackass. <laughs> Dennis James was James. the first to appear in a television commercial for Wedgwood China. I, I Wedgwood China. It's when you're that, having your mother in law over. I always knew that there was somebody that was the first person to do yeah. this. Like I just did, I was like, how would I ever you know and Nobody gives a crap. Uh, he was the first to MC a variety show on TV. He was the first to appear on videotape. The guy apparently has over twenty seven firsts and no nice. one knows who this guy is. No. Well I, it's like I mean uh you know, my dad did a lot of firsts right. and right. things. Yeah, that's and true. nobody has any idea who he is. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. Is that me? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, unfortunately, due to contractual obligations, James couldn't do the, sh- the prices right, and CBS asked Bob Barker to host. Uh, James actually filled in for Barker during four daytime episodes in December of 1974, the only four episodes that Bob Barker ever missed when he was recording. He had to go on a secret mission for the government. Yeah. He was also an assassin. I don't know if he... Yeah. Uh, we'll cover that in the next episode. It was pretty crazy. <laughs> he was trying to take out Pol Pot. That was, uh, this is the little, little known fact is that uh, Confession of a Dangerous Mind is actually about Bob Barker. It's just that Chuck Barris stole the idea because Man. he steals all his we ideas. We need to talk about Chuck Barris. We will. On we the will. Yeah. Step to show that guy. <laughs> uh, so Bob Barker was born in the state of Washington, but he spent most of his youth on the Rosebud Indian Reservation in Mission, South Dakota. Ooh. Uh, his dad was a quarter Sioux, which made him one eighth Sioux. Uh, he was actually showed up on a bunch of uh, the U.S. Indian roles. Like their roll call thing they did for like 100 years. You know what's really weird? Is his brother was a boy named Sue, who was also 1 8 Sue. Bob Barker met his wife, Dorothy Joe, at an Ella Fitzgerald concert when he was 15. Nice. Attending high school in Missouri. Yeah, it's like, that's pretty rad. I, I just can't believe that Ella Fitzgerald was allowed to play in Missouri. I, in, I know. In that year. It, this was, it would have been in like 19. Oh, no, it would have been the 40s, yeah. the late 30s. Or early 40s. You didn't have a very good time before or after that show. Uh, he joined the United States Navy Reserve in 1943 during World War II to train as a fighter pilot, but did not serve on active duty. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> during leave from the military, he married Dorothy Joe on January 12th, 1945. Nice. There's no more Dorothy Joes. No, she sounded like a really nice person. I know, but I mean, just, we don't name no, people no, we like don't. that. No, no, we don't. We don't. Now it's like... Nobody's, Zib, nobody's named Dorothy anymore at all. Like, I, I only, don't think so. I only knew one Dorothy growing up. Now it's Zib- all Cimarron and Italians. <laughs> <laughs> he had uh, gone to Drury College in Missouri. Wait, uh, Drury? Drury, yeah. Uh, after the war, he returned to finish his education, graduating summa cum laude with a degree in economics. Nice. Isn't it summa cum laude? Uh, however you say it. Okay. I don't know. Some, some come I'm loud. I'm one. Some come loud. And some don't. <laughs> <laughs> Barker moved to Los Angeles in 1950 to pursue a broadcasting career. He was given a show, The Bob Barker Show, that ran for six years out of Burbank. Nice. It was just by chance that he was hosting a show named after right. him. <laughs> he auditioned for it, and they're like, well, <laughs> we got two other Bob Barkers we're looking at right now, but... <laughs> One of them is in the but army. I just get, it's just the thing that it's like he went, he came to LA and then had his own show for six That's years. That's how it was, like, man. It's crazy. Because it was, this is the beginning of television. Yeah. Nobody thought anything was going to happen. It's the same thing with the internet yeah. and all yeah. this crap. You know, when the internet first started, I had short films on that were getting millions of views. Nobody yeah. gave yeah. a crap <laughs> since or whatever. It's easy to get on the ground floor, but to keep moving up like he did takes a lot of talent and hard yeah. work. Yes, yes, completely. Uh, as shown by the fact that in 1956, he started hosting Truth or Consequences. Truth uh, or Consequences. The game show. It was actually the game show's third host and also did not realize that Truth or Consequences at that point had been, well, granted it was a radio show, but it had been on the air for like 20 years. Yeah. It was like, if you didn't tell the truth... <laughs> They would murder you. It was. It, that was the consequence. This is the funny. This, this is the funny thing is that I, I didn't. I didn't include it in this in the script. But uh, the way the game show ran was that you were given an, an insanely hard quiz question, mm-hmm. and you had two seconds to answer it, and they just expected you not to answer it, and then they made you do something stupid. Yeah, it was, was all it. about humiliation. That was it. It was like okay, uh, but Bob Barker the Japanese hosting, uh, perfected that, by the way. Well, the yes, of course, they took control. that, yes, yes. He started hosting the Miss Universe and Miss USA pageants in 1967. In 1981, his wife, Dorothy Joe passed away at the age of 53 from lung cancer. Damn, very, very young. Very yeah, young. Very sad. Uh, shortly after, he became an advocate for animal rights and of animal rights activism, supporting groups such as the United Activists for Animal Rights and the Sea Shepherd Conservation Society. Yeah, he went full tilt animal after that, like... 
after his wife died, he ju- it became his thing. That was his thing. Yeah, because animals are much better than people. <laughs> That's true. And I personally would much rather hang out with animals than people. I I fully support uh, Bob Barker and all of his his animal rights and stuff. I am not a fan of PETA. Uh, oh no. But he gave uh, in nineteen no, it was in two thousand two thousand something. He gave like five million dollars for them to make a new uh, office building. Oh. Um, yeah. It's kind of like, eh. I just don't like the way... I like what they're for. Mm-hmm. I don't like the way that they implement their stuff. It's just well, bad. I, here's how I look at it. There's the NRA. There's all sorts of extreme organizations that yeah. are meant yeah. to go to the extreme. I'm not saying that PETA and the NRA are the same. No, but no, 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 no. I understand PETA going to the nth degree because that's how yeah, they have to do it. it. it and you, then they yeah, find some yeah. sort of thing in the middle. And then right, it's, right. You know, but I get you. I understand. Yeah, yeah. He started using the have your pet spayed or neutered at the end of shows in 1982. Uh, in 1987, Barker requested the removal of fur prizes for the Miss USA pageant and stepped down as host when the producers refused. Good for him. Yeah, he, he stuck with his guns. He was, yeah. In 1987, he did what almost no other TV show host would dare do. He stopped dyeing his hair and let himself go full gray. Nice. And it only raised the ratings of The Price is Right. People were so into it. Yeah, he was a silver fox. He was. He totally was. On Halloween in 2006, Barker made his announcement that he would retire from The Price is Right in June 2007. It, was, it wasn't as sad as it would be because he was dressed as Harley Quinn. <laughs> it was distracting. <laughs> it was the heels. The heels really threw me. Well, it was the ripped up. Fishnets. Yeah, yeah. He has really nice legs and he a does. pretty scooty patootie. <laughs> He's made three appearances on the show since: uh, once to promote his autobiography, one to celebrate his 90th birthday, and then once for an April Fool's Day joke where he hosted the first bid in the first game before handing the reins back to Drew Carey. Nice. Uh, Barker is a 19-time winner of competitive daytime Emmy awards from 43 nominations. Excellent. 14-time winner of Daytime Emmy Award for Outstanding Game Show Host. As the host of The Price is Right, he was nominated 23 times. Four-time winner of Daytime Emmy Award for Outstanding Game Show is the executive producer of The Price is Right from 19 nominations. And one nomination for Daytime Emmy Award for Outstanding Special Class Program as the co-host of the 1985 CBS Tournament of Roses Parade. Tournament of Roses Parade. Ugh. Back when I think I cared about the Tournament of Roses Back parade, when anybody did. Nobody I, watches that. Yeah. It's like the the Hollywood Christmas parade. Nobody watches that. I, so. In 1995, he received the Lifetime Achievement Award from the Daytime Emmys, and they named Stage 33 the Bob Barker Studio at CBS Television City in his honor. Good. And he's now 98, and he's still kicking. Nice. Uh, Who's I he mean, kicking? It's, he's not kicking his dog. Uh, actually, that's for sure. Adam Sandler. He every, every third Tuesday he goes over and he gives him a swift kick in the pants. Good. Yeah. Keeps him honest. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> Barker left some big shoes to fill when he retired in 2007, and producers considered just about everybody in Los Angeles. Among the contenders were John O'Hurley. Uh, P.J. Peterman. J. Peterman, yeah. What are you doing, Elaine? <laughs> <laughs> he would have been a good host. He would have been. Mean, He's got that great voice. Yeah, he does, he does. Uh, George Hamilton, everybody's favorite Ooh. overtainer. Yeah, and Zora the Gay Blade, baby. Yeah, he would have been good, too. Uh, George Hamilton. Although I'd, I've never seen him host anything. So He's I don't charming. Know. He's fine. He's just a little old now. It's like, <laughs> well, it's yeah. like okay, we're getting rid of the 90-year-old to give it to an 88-year-old. <laughs> Uh, they also considered Mario Lopez. He has enough. Yeah. He, he has plenty. That is the one that I'm definitely sure. <laughs> I'm glad that he did He not. is a great presenter, like a E.T. Yeah. kind of guy, yeah. you know? Uh, but uh, game shows is a different animal, yeah. and it takes a different kind of energy, and he's just got that phony energy to me. Yeah, 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 yeah. You yeah. need – de- Drew Carey is perfect for that show because he's got the sincerity that you need yeah. to host. Yeah. Comedians yeah. are so good for that because – they know how to connect with people. Yeah. They know how to get personal. the funny out of people. Mm-hmm. And they're also usually genuinely interested in people. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Uh, they also considered Rosie O'Donnell. Man. Okay. <laughs> Look, Rosie was big, man. She had her show and she had a big crush on Tom Cruise. I'm Cruz. not going to say it. What were you going to say? <laughs> She's big. Is she, Jim? <laughs> I was once in Chin Chin. And Chin Chin used to have this, like, pickup area so yeah. you didn't have to go in the restaurant you just go pick up your food yeah. yeah there was this line out the door that we were waiting in i feel this mushing up against me and i look over oh god and rosie o'donnell with like 
I didn't look. I'm not trying to disparage her at all. This is just my reporting. Who looked like she hadn't showered in like three days, <laughs> comes barreling in, throws literally throws a ha- handful of cash at the people and is like, "Give me my food!" Oh my god! And they hand her a food and she fucking blip blip, you know, yeah. bulled in a china shop's her way out of the little area and everybody's like, "Come on!" <laughs> Oh, it was so rude. It was so entitled, man. Don't you know who I am? She didn't even have the time to say no. that. She's like, break my phone! It's oh. just like, chuck the phone. It was just, I mean, maybe she had a bad day at the show or something. I don't know. But I, that kind of stuff just bugs me. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's never good. So, yeah, Drew Carey took over in 2007. He's hosted ever since. Uh, they've done a ton of primetime shows since Carey took over. They've also tried to up the money that's been given away to compete with some of the other large cash prizes offered for modern game shows. To achieve this, they've actually made the games easier. It's actually much easier to win now than it was previously. On the prices, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was, it was one of his stipulations when he got hired is that he wanted more people to win. Well, yeah. I, which I, makes sense. I mean, the more money you give away, the more people are going to watch, the more they're going to want to do it. Mm-hmm. They don't really get – we'll get into the, yeah, the yeah. situation of we'll the prizes, about. which is a little bit sneaky if yeah, you ask yeah, me. Yeah, yeah. The record for the largest individual total in cash and prizes on a daytime episode is $262,743, which aired during what they called Big Money Week. They actually took Plinko and changed it from $10,000 to uh, $100,000. Plinko! Yeah, Plinko. Uh, he won uh, $202,000 from Plinko, a new car, a diamond tennis bracelet, and a trip to Fiji. Nice. I wonder if he gave his lover the tennis bracelet on the trip to Fiji. I, I, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> the record for winnings on the primetime show is from the first The Price is Right $1 million spectacular. It happened like a month after Kerry uh, took over the, the hosting duties. Cash and prizes included $20,000 cash from the winner's minigame, and by being within a $1,000 of the actual retail price of his own showcases, he won both showcases, which included a Cadillac XLR convertible in his showcase and a Ford Escape hybrid in his opponents, plus a $1 million bonus. Nice bonus. That is a bonus and a half, yeah. Uh, in fact, the guy who won is, uh, I think, ranked like eighth on the all-time game show winners list. From one show. It's crazy. Not bad. Yeah. Terry Nice holds the record for the closest bid on a showcase without going over, guessing the exact price of the showcase he was given. Nice, an avid viewer of the show, recorded and watched every episode for four months prior to when he and his wife had tickets to attend in September 2008. Nice learned that many prizes were repeatedly used, always at the same price, and began taking notes. See, when you get lazy, people pay attention. Research. Uh, Nice was selected as a contestant on September 22nd, 2008, lost his pricing game, the only contestant to do so that episode, made it to the final showcase, and guessed the exact amount of $23,743 for his showcase. Uh, Many show staffers, including Carrie, were worried that the show was rigged and that Nice was cheating. Why? Uh, Because he he guessed exactly. Nobody In 50 years, no one had ever done that. Crazy. Uh, it was exactly exact. The like, people had, I think, the closest before that was like four dollars or something. But if you get within a hundred, they would give you both uh, of the the showcases. At least during the Barker era, during Carrie, I think it was a thousand dollars. Nice later explained that he had seen all three of the items of the showcase before, knew the general prices in the thousands. The seven four three he used because it was his pin based on his wedding date and his wife's birth month. So it was just by chance. Who's got a three? Number pin. His it was the end of his pin, I believe. Um, they, I want to get his card. I want if it's still his pin. It'd they be got easy to. They got married out. on March seventh, and then he his wife's birthday was April third. So his so his pin is three seven four three probably. Probably. All right, people, <laughs> go get nicest card. You know he's got some money in the bank. Uh, Kerry attributed his subdued reaction to the perfect bid by saying, "Everybody thought somebody had cheated." I remember asking, "Are we ever going to air this?" And nobody could see how we could. So I thought, the show was never going to air. I thought somebody had cheated us, and I thought the whole show was over. I, I thought they were going to shut us down, and I thought I, I was going to be out of a job. Yeah, it didn't, it didn't happen. It happened like a year after he took over. So, like, he, he was also, I, he got really vocal about being very insecure about the job. It was very weird at the time. I, I mean, look, you Jim Carrey yes. is great, but he's also taking over for a guy that did it for 40 years. Or Drew Carey? 
What did I say? <laughs> Jim Carrey. <laughs> They're both great. <laughs> the Carrey brothers. Uh, people don't know that. They're brothers. Um, uh, adopted brothers. Right. Right. Uh, but, uh, but, but Drew Carey's great. He's good yes. in the show. Drew Carey had great success as a comedian, great success as a, as a sitcom star. Yeah. Um, he was, and he was hosting uh, Whose Line Is It Anyway? Like, sure, but this is a time. completely different animal. You're taking no, 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 over, no, I realize. But you're yeah. taking over – it would be like taking over the Indiana Jones franchise yeah. or something. Yeah. I mean, you're you're stepping into the shoes of somebody who's so beloved. Yeah. And who – look, Bob Barker, much like uh, – Alex Trebek. Alex Trebek, the Canadian love. The Canadian Bob Barker? Yes, the Canadian <laughs> Bob Barker. Look, they were – as big as the show. I mean, the yeah. show was them because they were with it so long and the show developed with them. Yeah. Yeah. That it's going to be very hard for anybody to accept somebody new. I think with uh, Jeopardy, it's almost a little easier because yeah. that host has a, a not as much water to carry as hmm, Drew Carey. Uh, <laughs> because it's a much more exciting and dynamic yeah. and there's so much yeah. crap going on and you have to keep the energy it's, it's up here, you have fast. to keep, keep, yeah. keep, pop, yeah. pop, pop, keep it moving. And of course, so I get it, man. That's, it's a whole different animal. So. Yeah, and it is, you know, it is. It was a risk for him, a definite risk. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it, and it's, and it's funny because rewatching old, uh, old episodes on Pluto TV, they, they have a channel called the Barker Era, which I yeah. found out is the only place you can watch it is, is on Pluto TV. But, uh, it's amazing how, I, I, I forgot how much banter bob barker did with the contestants mm-hmm. like they were he would go on and on and on i was like there's a show that needs to happen like why are you still talking to this person so you really love scuba diving <laughs> yeah huh? what's like, that like he pulled some lady in that was from georgia and he thought she was samoan and just went on and on and on about you it. look samoan to me because he was like did you see when the samoans threw me around the stage and i was like what are you talking about <laughs> he's a personable guy yeah yeah but but i think i think with carrie I think that as just a sitcom star, he was fine. But I think what what got him into this and got him the job was the Who's line. Well, sure. Because, because that aired so much, and people knew him, and they knew he was personable and fun. And you had to think yeah. on your feet because it was an improvised yeah. show. There wasn't a lot Although of stuff he written. was by far the weakest link of that show. <laughs> yes. Well, in, and that's improv, not his fault. For improv. But He's that's, a comedian. Yeah. That's not, he just loved yeah. the show. I mean, look, you're dealing with Ryan Styles and Colin Mockery. Colin Mockery. Yeah. You know, and Great uh, groups. Like, these guys are yeah, Wayne they're, Brady. They're Wayne brilliant. Wayne Brady, they're yeah. all really, really good at what they do. Yeah. And, yeah, yeah. and he's fine. But he was yeah. he was great as the host because he enjoyed yeah sitting up there and giving him the he, things to do and laughing and scoring them and he was the person in the audience that was able to host the show mm-hmm. and, exactly and and, and and that's the the energy that he brought to the Price is Right kind of Loki I'm you? I'm one of you like this and we can just do it yeah. yeah so I'm just here to hang out with you you're from Duluth that's really cool <laughs> yeah okay uh, so uh, Terry Nice later defended his actions claiming that he never cheated in the end he was given his prizes uh, there's actually a documentary called Perfect Bid that is literally on every single free streaming service you can think of highly recommend it it's really good it's done really well um Nobody makes it to the stage on The Price is Right without catching the eye of longtime production assistant Stan Blitz. Stan Blitz! Since 1979, Blitz has evaluated everybody who walks through the studio's door and decides within seconds who will get a coveted spot at the front. I'm looking for... I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, we've actually talked to Stan Blitz, and I didn't yeah. realize I, I had at the time, but... I am looking for energy, sincerity, and potential humor, and if they can equal my energy or exceed it, I'll maintain it there on the top of the list. He does that every time. It is not annoying at all. No, he's it's a very charming, <laughs> weird gibberish. He's, yes, and he's been doing it since 1979, literally one year less than I've been born. So, I, yeah. Uh, from personal experience, if you want to get selected for the show, bring a large group, all wearing the same shirts. With the focus on one person. Yes. Like they love birthday crap. Or, yeah. Or if it's your bachelor party or your bridal shower. It's not guaranteed that you'll get on, but if you've got 20 shirts that say happy birthday person, and yes. they'll get that person on because they can always cut back to all the idiot friends cheering. And Yeah. yeah. I've been a couple times. The person that we – we went with our friend Lauren. Uh, mm-hmm. It was her birthday. And so we all had our Lauren birthday shirts. Yeah, yeah. And there was a big group of us. And Lauren is extremely personable. She was on, uh, I think she was on Conan or something, wasn't she? Didn't she used to be on one of the late night shows? She would, was, I she think. She was like the audience been, member. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That character. She's really funny. Very, very funny. She's very good, yeah. And uh, 
she got picked to be a contestant. Yes. On The Price is Right. And, she uh, came on down. She came on down, and she did great. She ended up winning a uh, like a restaurant-style like an espresso, espresso maker. Yeah. And, really and expensive. It was like six hundred dollars or something. It, it was more than that. It oh, was, was like it two thousand? Oh, was it? Oh, oh, oh I think oh. the t- here's the thing that sucks. Yeah, <laughs> let's, okay? let's, let's talk about the prizes. First of all, they gave us all a bunch of uh, Nicholas Sparks books. Oh, that's for right. Free. And they had uh, one of the one of the prizes of the stars was stars like, came out and talked or something. I don't. Yeah, I don't know. And then one it of the was, prizes yeah. was a library of Nicholas Sparks. I don't. know. If you know Nicholas Sparks is the Notebook and all those. Yeah. Little, I have never, it's, it's since <laughs> seeing pictures of book burnings and book trashings of Nazi Germany, I have never seen so many books in trash cans and discarded <laughs> it was in my so entire horribly life. sad. <laughs> Nobody wanted those books, so I'm really glad Miss, Mr. Sparks was there because he would have cried uh, like a little. Because yeah. nobody wanted his little little tear jerkums. But here's the thing: other than that horrible uh, book book collection that they thrust upon us when you win on the price is right you have to pay the taxes for that prize that day yeah to take it home yeah so if you want a car that is a thirty thousand dollar car you got to come up with three grand yeah that day to yeah take it home now i don't know if you win cash and prizes if you can deduct the cash Use right. that. Use the cash that you win for the thing. Minus whatever taxes you owe on the cash. But if you don't have the money to pay for it, you don't get the prize. And you cannot get the cash equivalent. No. So either you pay the taxes and take the prize, or you forfeit the prize. Wow. And then they reuse that prize. Yeah, they have. That is the scam of the price is right <laughs> that I that drives me nuts. Because a lot of people don't have Six grand yeah. on hand to be able to pay for your dinette set and your new car and your this right, and that. Right. It's really cool and it's really exciting to win. But so many people that I know that have been on and won, it was just so disappointing at the end. Even Lauren yeah, was really yeah. bummed out because, you know, that cleaned her out. Yeah. She yeah. only did it because she knew she could sell it on eBay. Right, and right. Get a She'd decent get price, get her money yeah. back. But I just, that takes away a little of the joy from me. Yeah. Because knowing that all of that excitement and joy that people yeah. feel when they're winning is just kind of crushed after the show's over. And they're like, all right, pay up. Yeah. That was that was uh, first brought to my attention when Oprah did the whole car giveaway thing. And, and then it was literally the next day people were like, yeah, yeah, real exciting. I had to pay four grand or five grand in taxes to get this car. It's like it wasn't a free car. Right. And granted – you can sell the car for more or whatever. I get it. But if you don't have that, but four if you're or five frigging grand, Oprah you Winfrey, you should yeah. be able to pay the taxes. Yes. You know, yes. cover the taxes. That's just, you know, I get it. I don't know if, like, if they can cover the taxes, you know? I assume so. I, I mean, when I won, yeah. they taxed it as income. Right. So it was only 10%. Right. And I, I had to pay my taxes. They didn't take anything they out. They didn't take anything out. They, they just gave me the full amount. They gave me the amount, and then I had to pay a oh. grand. I had to pay yeah. 10%. Yeah. Um, but, you know, yeah. at the end of the deal. And, you know, which was great. But granted, it took almost six months to get the prize yeah, money yeah, because that yeah. stuff. Because that's, that's the other thing is that you don't get any. If you do win anything, uh, you do not get it until the show airs. And Unless you're on Price is Right. Well, right, right. Other game shows, yes. Because the Price is Right. They have they air pretty. They turn over so quickly. Yeah, yeah. And and they have to, you know, the the, the way the prize thing is, you know, it's yeah, nobody. Yeah. It, it's not about who wins or what you win. Yeah, you know, on the Price is Right, it's about the energy and the this yeah, and the yeah. That. So yeah, they don't really yeah. care if like, oh, I want a car. You know, it's right, like, how right. did you get to win the car? You yeah. know, but with a other type of game show, it's yeah. the competition, and it's yeah. like, well, you know, we want to know who wins and who loses. But you know, I think. That, with that one, it's like everybody can win and everybody can lose. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I think I just uh, I just find that practice to be a little sleazy. I don't know if it's just a, yeah. a complete legal thing or however, yeah. but I, I think they can structure it in a way that's less devious in a way. Because they don't tell you, right. like, right. okay, when you're, you're going to have to. When you're standing in line for right. four and a half hours. 
Exactly. Exactly. To, you know? to get in and see if you can get on. But I think the thing about this show that is better than any other show and more exciting than any other show is that if you're visiting Los Angeles with your family, yeah. you could get on that show that day. Yeah. Yeah. You don't have to audition. You yeah. don't have to, I mean, you have to do things in line sure, to sure. make yourself stand you out. Talk to the person. Yeah. But it's not there's no test. There's no Mm-mm. It's just being there. That's what I love about it. I love the I, fact that it's it's yeah. anybody, anywhere, anytime could get on that show. As long as you make Mr. Blitz happy. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> but, yeah, but, yeah, I yeah. mean, that's what I love about that show. That's what makes it so exciting to go as an audience member. Mm-hmm. That's one yeah. of the only game shows I've seen as an audience member. Yeah, same. And I, and I, I don't uh, – I mean, I – for me, it was never about getting on the prices right. I never, I've never, I love the show. Sure. And it's one of my favorite game shows. But it's, it was never, I mean, because I could be down there every time they shoot and mm-hmm. be trying to get on. Yeah. But, like, that wasn't the point. It was just to be there and see it and, sure. like, take it all in. And we were there to get our friend on because it was yeah. her birthday. And yeah. that was her dream was to get on. Yeah, it is. It is really a fun thing for out of towners to be able to come in and do, and it, it will eat up the entire day uh, because you got to get there super early and wait in line and they just make you wait oh, in yeah. line. Oh no, it's your line, entire and day, and then yeah. you wait to tape, and then the taping takes yeah. a while. And, but it's a fun time, and if you're with your friends, you're just you know jamming around, bring some edibles. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but yeah, I mean, and then uh, uh, a couple of years later. Lauren and I were teammates on another game show. Oh, yeah, that's right. America Says. America Says, yeah. The Price is Right is America's game show. Yeah, yeah. It's the show for anybody. You don't have to be smarty smarts like Jeopardy. You don't have to, you know, guess words and stuff like uh, uh, like Wheel of Fortune. Yeah, yeah. You don't have to know knowledge. you got to know what prices are. and you, yeah. you, know, you can guess. It's just everybody, anybody can play and win that game. Yes. That's the beauty of it. Yeah. There's no... You know, it's America's game show, I think, right? <laughs> I would think so, yeah. I mean, it's not, it's a very, I don't want to say populist game show or whatever, but like it's, it is, it literally is anybody can win. And it's basically a good allegory, you know? It's just yeah. like a bunch of, you know, overweight, lazy Americans. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> a, bunch of, <laughs> a bunch of lazy Americans going in to get free stuff. Yeah. And then, the and government giving them the shaft at it the is, end and realizing there is no free lunch. It is the absolute perfect allegory for America. Yes, it is. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, if you're going to get on that show, make sure you got some money in your bank account. Uh, there was one other little funny anecdote that I, I wanted to talk about just because it happened in 2015. I thought it was really funny. Uh, comedian Danielle Perez was a big Price is Right winner. She won her very own treadmill. The problem, as was very obvious to everyone in the audience... Perez was wheelchair bound, having lost both her legs to an accident in 2004. I just thought, oh, this is perfect. You can't outwrite this. You cannot make this up. It's not even that I'm in a wheelchair. It's that I literally don't have feet. She thought it was hysterical. Like, <laughs> Drew Carey was horrified. Oh, yeah, of course. But she thought it was the funniest thing ever. Well, it is, I mean, you, and that, she's a comedian, you know? <laughs> yeah, you yeah. look at things, you look at the, you gotta look at the funny side of things or you blow your brains out. Yeah. <laughs> There have been uh, numerous board games and card games and video games based off The Price is Right since its inception. In fact, the original board game is older than the board game Risk. Damn. Which is weird because I thought Risk was like 100 years old, and it's not. It came out in 1959. Yeah. Uh, and the original Price is Right board game came out in 1958. Interesting. Yeah. The last video game that came out was a version for the PS3 in 2012. It seems weird. Yeah, board I did, game. yeah, I mean, I can see a video game because there's... I remember them during the 80s, like the the home version, the home... Everything had a yeah, home yeah. version. But it's... It could work. I mean, but even video games, it's just not conducive to that. You, yeah. You watch it. Contestants <laughs> like get a promotional prize of rice yeah. Roni, yeah. the rice Roni treat, yeah. turtle wax to wax your cars, <laughs> and the home game of Jeopardy by Milton Bradley. Yeah. Take Jeopardy home to play with your family. What is <laughs> family fun? <laughs> Uh, well, that's all I got. That's it for That's enough, baby. Right. That's a lot of prices right. There's a lot of prices right. I love it. I realized while working on this episode that I think the prices right might be my favorite game show. It might actually eke out just over Jeopardy, mm. but only because it is accessible by anybody. Sure. And it's also really exciting and fun. And, and Jeopardy is more about being smug. <laughs> being like, I know that. Mm. What is? I'm pretty smart. <laughs> <laughs> it's all about smugness. It really is. Uh, I mean, Jeopardy is a, is is all about proving to yourself that you're not a complete moron. Yeah. B- 
But you can truly enjoy The Price is Right and enjoy other people winning prizes because it doesn't test your intelligence. <laughs> you know, there's no jealousy there. Of, mm-hmm. Right. I don't know. I, I guess that hi-fi is worth $2,015. The, the irony is that Jeopardy will prove to you very repeatedly how stupid you are. Oh, yeah. And the prices are, will just prove how stupid everyone else is. There you go. Perfect time, <laughs> perfect way to end the show. Uh, we'll be back next week with a, another little game show called... Oh. Going to get your cocktails ready. Get your long, skinny mics, people, because yeah. we're doing a little a match game. Woo! A big band, le- <laughs> big band, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or it's yeah, like yeah. they have this whole thing. Well, they would uh, the uh, that. We now return you to your regularly scheduled programming. Blossom, already in progress.